Now let's get going, folks, and we'll begin like we will every day here on Menzoid Mornings with something that's really grinding my gears. Time now for the Menzoid Monologues. Well, was it good for you? I speak of the ice hockey version of the never-ending story, namely the National Hockey League lockout. After all, was there anything more scintillating than five months' worth of shinny shysters facilitating news conferences in which they'd announce that there was, well, nothing to announce. To paraphrase Foster Hewitt, he shoots, he bores. But on Sunday, a delayed version of the Christmas miracle took place when it was indeed announced that hostilities in the boardroom would cease and the puck would soon drop. A good thing, too, when watching millionaire hockey players wage war with billionaire ho hockey team owners, it's hard to choose a side. It reminds me of the tagline for Aliens vs. Predator. Whoever wins, we lose. In any event, here are my original six random thoughts on the lockout lunacy we just endured. Number one, who are the winners? Well, that's easy, folks. It is both the players and the owners. As for the losers, well, for starters, it's us, the fans. As sure as there's salt water in the Pacific, ticket prices will eventually increase to make up for the revenue losses. And sponsors will be losers, too. They'll be subjected to higher sponsorship fees and even cities, at least those cities that cave into blackmail tactics, will be losers. You know how it goes. The owner says the current arena isn't suitable anymore, so build us a new playpen or we're moving. There's nothing like extortion when it comes to getting taxpayer-funded corporate welfare. And sadly, folks, it often works. Number two, is it just me or was it downright perverse that there's a so-called union comprised of multi-million dollar hockey players in the first place? After all... When it comes to the rank and file of the NHL Players Association, the battle cry isn't solidarity forever. Rather, it's every man for himself. Case in point, about 200 NHL players were actually playing pro hockey elsewhere during the lockout. Oh, no picketing for these guys. So when the Washington Capitals, Alexander Ovechkin, was suiting up for Moscow Dynamo, guess what? He took a job away from one of the Russian players who used to be on Dynamo's roster. Put another way, if the guys at the General Motors Oshawa plant were to go on strike, they don't drive down the highway to get jobs at the Ford assembly plant in Oakville until their strike is over. What a perverse joke. Number three, the player said the battle isn't about padding their wallets. Rather, it's all about ensuring prosperity for the next generation. It's kind of like those teachers who say their work stoppages are always about the kids. Good one. But throwing a spanner into the works in those markets that aren't hockey hotbeds might eventually prove self-defeating. Put another way, the seven Canadian NHL cities will be impervious to any work stoppages. South of the border, I'd argue there are a solid dozen U.S. cities where the NHL is rock solid. That leaves another dozen teams that are on thin ice. Indeed, some sports experts have speculated in the next five years as many as five NHL teams might relocate, merge, or simply fold. Fewer NHL franchises means fewer NHL jobs. So please again tell me how this work stoppage was all about guaranteeing a brighter future for the players and upcoming draft picks. Number four, is there no shame these are not buoyant economic times, especially in many regions south of the border. And when NHL players actually sought public sympathy for their plight, it was downright nauseating given there are people without jobs, some people even relying on food stamps to get by. Then again, then again I, I truly fear some of these athletes actually believe they're, they're worth $10 million a year to play hockey. If so, this proves... You don't need to be cross-checked into the boards to suffer the effects of a concussion. Number five, the $64,000 question remains. Why wasn't this silly dispute settled back in September? What took so long to reach a deal? Is the, is the answer nothing more than egomania? Players union boss Donald Fair lorded over eight work stoppages when he was the head of the Major League Baseball Players Union. He was victorious each and every time. NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman, meanwhile, typically gets his way when it comes to fixing labor pains. So was this lockout really all about two egomaniacs trying not to lose face? 
Sure looks that way to me, folks. Number six, finally, I'd be lying if I told you that I don't miss watching my mighty Maple Leafs. And no, folks, I'm not a sadomasochist. But life went on for us all without NHL hockey. While I still feel nothing but contempt for both the owners and the players, I've always felt badly for one constituency. All the people who depend on NHL hockey to make a living from the ushers and concessionaires at the rinks to the bartenders and the wait staff at pubs and restaurants. These are the folks who were really and truly screwed these past several months. Not that the owners or players give a rodent's rectum, mind you. Bottom line, NHL hockey is indeed returning to a rink or TV channel near you. The question remains, do enough people, especially in weak US markets, even give a damn anymore? And that's the Menzoid Monologue.